Uh, welcome to Champion Ways. My name is Kyle Alderink, and I'm so pumped to have my man Scott Hamilton with me. And Scott, you're pretty highly sought out at this point, as we were talking about. I know everybody wants to get you to speak because you're always very entertaining. So I'm excited to, uh, to get some stuff and really get your take on, you know, the tour level golf too, because Scott is one of the top tour teachers, I think it's fair to say, out there, and you're working with what, like 15 guys, 15, 20? Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot. You know, I'll average six to eight players a week normally. You wow. know, luckily, sometimes I'll have like five, but most of the time I'll have at least six guys. But yeah, I teach, you know, I got, I got a bunch of guys on the PJ Tour. Then I'm, you know, I have a couple girls on the LPGA, and then I have some web guys. And, you know, I got Canadian, Latin America. Uh, everywhere one you I have one senior tour guy Joe Durant so yeah uh, I mean your your resume is well deserved I mean your top teacher on every list out there and uh I mean you obviously done really well for yourself so so thank you for coming on and talking to me this is going to be pretty cool I think and you know um if you remember the first time we actually met I think was that it wasn't the Duke top teacher summit it was the one in Florida I think you spoke at it yeah remember which one I'm talking about the golf magazine one? Oh, was it the one, the top 50? Yeah. It was like the top 50, and they picked a few instructors to do a presentation. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The week of the PGA show. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so you that did. was like one of the first ones I ever did. I was nervous as a, as a half <laughs> cat at that thing. Well, it, you know, I remember, like, your presentation was, was incredible. And, um, you know, and I just, I remember, I just never forget this, and, you know, you had guys asking you about all this really deep technical stuff about releases and all that. You just said, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man, I just get my guys to hit it good. Like, that's, that was your response. I'm like, I love this guy. Like, this is awesome. Well, the, the problem, I do all these teaching things. And, like, what's interesting to me is there's so much, and not knocking them, but there's so much, like, TPI stuff out there that everybody knows all these anatomical parts now. So, I mean, I can't give a teaching thing without somebody asking me how the femur bone fits in the hip jocket socket fits in the like man the golf swing lasts for a tour guy 0.96 of a second they don't give a damn about their femur bone and how it fits in the you know i mean yeah they want their pelvis to work right but like all that all that really complicated conversation that goes with something that lasts 0.96 of a second they just they don't go. I think the instructor needs to know a lot of stuff, you know, every bone or muscle in the body. I'm not sure about that, but I mean, they, they make it so complicated. And normally, you know, when I teach, there's normally every guy has a tumor, like, and I always say, I'm trying to cut the tumor out. You know, I teach elite players, but, you know, you kind of ask them the basic questions when they show up, what they want, what ball flight they want to have, what's their big miss. And then you kind of make sure their pivot matches the shape of shots they're trying to hit. And just make it as simple as you can. And then literally redundantly, redundantly work on the one thing that serves Achilles heel, you know. So that's my method. And it's, you know, it's always worked pretty well. And then once you kind of clean that up, you still got some problems you can nitpick around. But a lot of times with a good player, if you cut the tumor out, a lot of the other things will fall in place for you anyway. Well, and I'll just start with that. I mean, I have a list of stuff I want to ask you, but just falling in line with that is that, you know, my thing is I, I just don't believe swings change that much. And, I mean, you could – I'm just kind of curious in your take, seeing the top-level guys, being around them all the time and girls. Um, like, are their bad habits always their same bad habits, or are they creating new Yeah, problems? 100%. Like, very rarely do people go have extreme – especially guys that's patterned it up as long as a tour guy. I mean, you can look at guys over the course of time. A lot of times, uh, like I saw a thing the other day where they showed like Tiger, you know, each year's golf swing. And they, yeah, it definitely had some different shapes to it. But the average guy on tour, I mean, the shape, the pattern just doesn't change that much. Mm -hmm. you no, know, they can get in trouble when the sequencing gets out of whack. But like how the club goes around them, just doesn't change that much. Right. Right. So what's the um, – so you do use – like, I, you know, I follow your social media and we've talked before, but, like, so what's the main kind of stuff you're using? Because I know in the past you've used Body Track, Swing Catalyst, TrackMan. So I know you have all of them. I see you getting into gears a little bit. Like, 
what like yeah. do you really focus on and what is really that important? And then second kind of follow up is like, how much are you implementing that when guys are preparing for events? Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, it's funny. I just did a presentation in the Carolina section. It was called blending technologies. Mm -hmm. So I really use four main things. I use the swing cap plate, uh, the 3d one, uh, just to look at the pressure shift. And the good thing about a swing cap plate, mine's set up an indoor studio and it shows the face on and down the line. So I got the input of video and the pressure at the same time and it's synced up. That's why I use that plate because the video is in line with where the, where the movement of the body is. Mm -hmm. And then I have a gears, the gears honestly has been more for me than the player. I've learned so much using that gears because I have such a huge database of good players and, I never really use technologies how the manufacturers tell them to use them. I run all my good players through there and see what the commonalities are that they do. Even though they all look different, they all kind of do some of the same things, like how the pelvis works and what happens with the right knee. And, you know, one guy like Boo might lag it and have a real, real, you know, square face. And a guy like Chris Kirk might, you know, not might come out of posture a little bit and be more in to out. But there are parts of the body movement, like what the pelvis and the spine do, that are super similar, you know, in real small ranges. So if I'm teaching a guy the first time, I'll always have him come to my studio and throw him up on the pressure mat, look at the shape of it, see if there's any obvious. Then I'll run a gears check on him just to see if there's, because some of the knee flex stuff you just can't see with the naked eye. And it'll have it'll affect the pressure. So if you fix that, and then throw them back on the pressure mat, you'll fix their pressure shift. And then obviously, I use TrackMan for ball, ball flight and kind of club data. And you know, I'm not a fanatic about a TrackMan. I love TrackMan. I use it all the time, but it's just a pattern for me. Like, I just want to jump on there and make sure Scott Stallings or Hudson has a negative club path, and I want to make sure Kirk has a positive club path. You know, but like, does it have to be two or it has to be, it's not how the world works, you know, <laughs> I mean, every turf condition on every range on the PGA tour, depending on where the wind's coming from affects angle of attack and swing directions. So, you know, those are the, the, the main tools that I use. And obviously video, you know, you can't be a good teacher without using video because you got to be able to show the student how you want them to change the shape, but the video and swing cat are kind of tied together. So I'll do that first and kind of get an idea of the direction I want to go and what I think the big problem is. And then, then we'll get in the car and the golf course is about 15 minutes away. And then we'll ride over the golf course and kind of get to work on. That's, that's generally how I do it. So, so talk to me about ball flights on the tour because I, and I've said this multiple, multiple times. People have this, I think false illusion that we got to hit the ball straight and online all the time. And I know you and I talked a little bit about this, but I think it's good for somebody who's around that to say it is like, how straight is the ball actually going? You know, there's guys that hit straight shots, but it's not the shot they hit on tour. They're always kind of working the wind. I mean, like this year it's rained and the wind has blown literally every week. It's more about controlling the spin and pushing it up into the wind. But, you know, if you're standing on the driving range and you're trying to hit perfectly straight six irons, you're not, you're never going to learn how to play great golf. That's not really what golf is. You know, golf is what really the most important thing is have a narrow one-way miss and then learn how to score. So what I want all my guys to do is, is miss it one direction. There's very few guys on tour that move the ball both ways efficiently. There's, and I heard Chris Kirk tell somebody one time, he goes, it's not that hard to be out here. You've got to be really good at one shot. So, and he's really good at hitting a push draw where, you know, or a lot of guys are really good at hitting the cut, but not a whole lot of guys, like, people think they jump up and, you know, like Scott Stallings, he cuts every single thing in his back in his bag, except he's got a three-wood he can hit a little draw with. So if he gets on a, a drive hole that he's got to hit a draw, he'll just hit three-wood. So what he's done with that is he takes a double cross out of there, you know, so – there's the guys on tour, the ones they show on TV got it on point. You know, the, the problem is kind of, they're kind of lying to you with the TV coverage because they're all striping it. But if you go out and watch a normal guy play, they miss the green from, from the middle of the fairway and they get it up and down. What, what people really don't appreciate is how good their short games are. Every guy out there, even the worst guy out there is 
pretty pretty damn good at chipping the golf ball and getting up and down from when he misses, you know, and not making a mess out of it when they hit in trouble. But well, yeah, that's that, just – go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think that's interesting because, I, you know, the value of short game to me has always been prevalent. And, you know, I think nowadays, especially with distance and all that, everything's getting to, like, hit it further, hit it further, and it's, like, kind of almost neglecting short game. But like yeah. you said, I mean, out there, maybe that's not the difference maker because they're so good at it. But it's like, I think for your, your college players, your high school players, that's huge. Well, the, it's the big thing that I see when a guy goes from the, from the web. If the guy that goes from the web tour to the PJ tour is first time. And it's really, really hard to keep your card. A, you don't get to play in that many events. If you don't play really well in the fall, then you don't reshuffle very well. But, you know, they get up there. You've got to be able to drive the ball on the PGA Tour. You've got to be a super efficient driver. Or you have to be super long, and you still can't be wild. You might not hit as many fairways, but you're so long that it doesn't matter. But the big difference is the chipping and putting. I mean, the, and that's where these guys can't save themselves and lose their card. You know, especially by the drives it efficiently, it's more of their short Right. <laughs> Drop my earpiece. No, all good. All good. Um, so, give me give me your thoughts, if you would, on like a model golf swing. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. Like I put a swing up the other day of this kid that uh, plays at Duke on my Instagram. It's that's pretty on point what he does. Right. But, you know, the thing, there's not really a model golf swing. Like, I look all the time when I do these presentations trying to find, I can find model positions to make shots of, but it, I can't really say that anybody has a perfect golf swing, and it's because there's give and take, and I tell people this all the time. If you're somebody that has a bunch of forward lean and you have a lot of, uh, you know, a real square face coming down, somebody like Boo Weekly. I mean, they're really great at hitting, compressing their irons. Uh, but a lot of times, now with Boo, it's not the fact, but a lot of times that's not the best way to hit a driver or you're not going to be the best short game. You don't chip that great. Or if you're in the lip of a bunker and you need to hit a high five iron out of there, there's nothing about your delivery that gives you that. But there's plenty of things in that delivery pattern that give you hitting at five feet from the middle of the fairway with a seven iron. So – Every golf swing has positives and negatives. I don't think there's, you know, there's one that's just that can do it all just because there's, you know, some guys are great in the wind and other guys are great when the greens are really hard, you know, because they can hit it 125 feet in the air. Right. Um, so, you know, like my thing is, and again, when we talked, I, you know, I'm big into the performance side, understanding how to practice to get better and stuff. So, like, what, what do tour players do? Like, what's the separator from – these guys that are always on there, always in contention versus, you know, somebody who's fighting for their card week in, week out. Because like you said, I mean, they all really have good short games. They all putt pretty well and they can all hit it, obviously, if they're there. So what, yeah, what do you really it think is, there, there is the X factor. Even there's the X factor of the guy, the guy that's a tour player. Then there's the X factor if you're the Jason Day or Jordan Spieth or uh, Justin Thomas. I mean, those guys have zero weaknesses in their game. They drive it good. They iron it good. They can hit long, high, you know, four irons. There's, there's just that certain group of guys that they just have zero weaknesses. And then there's a, that mid-level tour player where they're really good at 75% of it. But to be one of those top ten players in the world, you really can't have any weakness. I mean, and you're exceptional at everything. It's not, it's not you're pretty good at it. You're exceptional in every category. But, you know, I mean, so much of it, too, is a comfort zone. Like, those guys that are up there all the time, when you watch a guy get on a run and start playing good, he can play not that good and still score really well. When you watch a guy struggling, he can play really well but not score very well. So there's that confidence factor with the tour guys. When they get on a run, it's just like every week, you know, you'll get guys in a top ten four or five weeks in a row, and he's just on a hot run. and it's just his mistakes aren't catching up with him. He's, he's got so much confidence going. Yeah. It's hard to explain. It's, it's micro shots, you know, like microscopic a shot here or there is so huge out there. 
Well, and, and you're somebody who's, I mean, you can, you can just take the data of players that have come to you and have gotten better. I mean, and that's obviously why people keep coming to you and you keep growing because you're really good at what you do. So, like, how are you helping that level of player? Like, what do you think is the major thing? Do you think it's some of the technique stuff you do or is it, like, what, how you train? Like, you talked to me a little bit about some of the stuff you do in your practices that I think is really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the number one thing that, that, that I've kind of always been known for is I can make guys drive it in play. I kind of understand how the driver works and simplify it for guys. And there's some really simple stuff with a the driver. They make driver really complicated, but if, if people do three things, they're probably going to drive it fairly efficiently. If they don't have a radius change or like in redneck terms, or they don't hump it or their butt comes into the ball, if they can plane it, you know, if they can swing the club on an on a elbow plane line, and also if they can get the shaft coming in at touch relatively at 90 degrees. Well, if you can line those three things up, you're going to have a narrow miss. So I literally make driving that kind of simple. A lot of reasons, like the reason Martin's coming this weekend is because he's always driven it bad, and he heard that I can make guys drive it better. And, you know, it was an inter interesting story about him. He came up last uh, week on Wednesday, and he was supposed to spend three days with me. And he had been struggling. He's on the web this year and really been struggling. So I got him in there, and it was a classic. He had a radius change. His butt was coming way into the ball. And he had – both his knees were flexed. So I just straightened his right leg and made his pelvis work correctly. And ten minutes into the lesson, he's already swinging it way better, way more on top of it not moving into the ball nearly as much, kind of cleaned his backswing plane up a little bit. The phone rings, and it's the tour, and he got in Puerto Rico. And he's like, well, what do you think I ought to do? I'm like, man, you got to go play, dude. I've already half-assed fixed you here. Man, you're going to be on the planet. Like an hour, this is an hour and 15 minutes. So he hits balls for about five more minutes and jumps on a plane and rides over to Puerto Rico. And, and his tea time was like the crack of dawn, like seven in the morning the next day or something like that. And, you know, as an instructor, I'm like, this is a recipe for a disaster here. This is not. <laughs> but, you know, what do you tell a guy that has limited starts on tour? You go and play halfway decent, they can do so much for you. So he ran over there. He, he First round, no bogeys made the cut. I think he finished like 71% driving accuracy for the week. So a lot of times, you know, I'm not saying those are big fairways and it's easier to drive it, but the wind's blowing a million over there. But it's like a lot of times it doesn't take six months to fix somebody. You can do it relatively fast to make them quite a bit better. You make them a lot better to make somebody a lot better. It takes about six months. But to help somebody a little bit, you, you ought to be able to, as an instructor, if you know what you're doing, give them some relief right out of the gate. Not like, hey, go do these four drills for a month and maybe you'll get a little bit better. That's just not ever been my mindset. But, you know, and, and the, the other thing we were kind of talking about is, I've really, really tried to get away from my guys just standing out there trying to hit perfect golf shots on the range. We play way, way more games. And if a guy's striping it, I try to run them off the range. Because if you're hitting it really good, uh, then what are you going to gain if you're not working on short game or, or wedge carry stuff or stuff like that, or, or uh, which what we'll go into. And then if you're hitting it bad, then you're just ingraining it. Like one of the greatest things I ever heard, this Chris Kirk I teach is a character, man. And and he just looks at the world different than everybody else. And so he and I and John Tillery and I think a, another caddy, maybe Scott Brown and then a caddy were in, were out at dinner in Vegas. And, and uh, Tillery's like, uh, Kirky, man, why don't you ever hit balls after a round? And Chris sat there for a minute. And then Chris goes, well, John, he goes, I guess. He goes, if I'm hitting a good, why would I practice them? I hitting a bad. I don't want to ingrain that crap. So I mean, that's so true. What he said right there. So you know, another one um, that I really want to get your take on is just kind of the ups and downs of the swings of players, and like what's that like, and how how do you manage that? Help them manage that because I mean, obviously, especially at that level, somebody's having a bad week. I'm sure there's some stress. And yeah, it's it's not really bad weeks. It's bad months. That's what kill you. Like there's a lot. These guys miss cuts, man. And and it's not like you know when you're a kid and you're a pretty good player and you go miss a cut somewhere. It's devastating. They really don't put that much into it because they know they're going to miss cuts out there. I think the average guy makes the bulk of his money in six to nine weeks or something. But uh, it's whenever they get on bad runs and then you're in there and you're working on it more and your practice time becomes more 
teaching, that's kind of, it's when it can go sideways on you. Like when guys are playing good and you're on the range at a PJ tour event, you're really coaching. You're kind of doing track man games. You're working on distance stuff. You're working on one shot. You might be fitting a club. You know, they're literally warming up. You're kind of touching the one thing that you think is the important thing for the guy, the guy's mechanics. And oh, Scott lost his shoot. And, you know, they're all watching. I, I'm in a couple of those right now. You kind of – you're going to end up doing that. But you sure don't want it to last very long. And, you know, you want to get the guys out of that funk. And the worst thing is when guys go on bad putting runs and they're hitting it good, it runs right into their game after a while. If they – you know, you get somebody really struggling with their putting. And I'm not the greatest putting instructor in the world. I'm halfway decent at it. But, you know, you get – you get guys struggling with their putting, it's going to feed into their game because what happens is then they lose confidence and they don't hit it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so that's interesting because I think with like, you know, you pop on the TV and you see the tour guys in the warm up and everybody's got track man behind them. Like, yeah. I mean, everybody at this point, right? But I think the, the misconception that most people have is that they're out there working on stuff before before the thing. But, like, you're saying they're out there just kind of warming up and checking distances and stuff, right? Or are they actually – I mean, so, I mean, I'm, I'm standing on the range of the Honda yesterday. There's guys all around me with track bands running. There ain't nobody asking what their club path is out there, man. They're asking, is that – is that am I hitting that 100 feet? Is that the, – what's the spin on that? you know, cause they're always checking their spin numbers all the time. You know, maybe they've got a spin loft issue or something. Guys aren't standing out there. Very, there's honestly, I don't know a, a player that stands out there and looks at his angle of attack, swing direction, club path. They might look at their angle of attack and they go, was that real steep right there? Or, you know, something like that. But they're never using a track man like an instructor uses it in a lesson. They're using it for distance control, shot shape, you know. Literally, that's what the tour guys use them for. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's good to know, too, because, uh, you know, especially with, like, youth and players like that, I think they get so worked up on that stuff and, you know, kind of always use it, rely on it and stuff like that. And, you know, again, when I was playing, it was video. Like, everything was video. Yeah. You know, video. Yeah. You know, now it's like the track man. I mean, we – I use video – all the time like i'm just looking at shapes of the golf swing is the thing shallow and how much i want out of the top or is the right knee doing what i want it to do or is he slid over on top of it enough or you know i mean i use videos all the time so mm -hmm. i mean video is still the number one tool i don't i i own everything a human can own golf wise i probably got three hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff i still use my iphone more than anything you know mm -hmm. Um, so like, what are you, what are you doing out there? Like, I know you talked about a little bit of the warm up and stuff, but what are you doing to help players prepare? And then like, is, is there any difference of you doing for like getting ready for the masters or any, anything like that? You know, I hear guys, like I hear Cameron McCormick talk about all that, like what he and Spieth does. I've never really done that before for majors i mean more equipment stuff like you go to the british and everybody goes and gets a two iron that week so you hit something head high but you know kind of golf is golf and you just never know the conditions you're going to get when you get somewhere i mean like this week the greens are super firm i don't think the scoring is going to be that low this week but it rained a bunch the last couple of days so it's going to be soft with really hard greens that's a hard combination there so like how do you prepare for that you know i mean it's literally, I've never really, you know, and I'm friends with Scott Fawcett. I read a bunch of his stuff. He keeps me kind of, so I'll talk to guys about strategy of certain holes or, you know, hey, you're better off to miss in the left rough than the right fairway and stuff like that on certain holes, you know. But we, we'll do a decent amount of that. But, like, super preparation for one event, I've never, I hear guys talk about that, but I just, I've never experienced it. 
So you just kind of do the same thing for, for every event. Yeah. Do you have a way that you prepare guys, like a specific thing you do, or is it just kind of seeing where they're at? And No, each, I mean, each, each guy's a different individual. Each person practices different, practices different amounts, different times. You know, I mean, one of the biggest things you can be, one of the reasons I have success out there is I'm easy, just whatever they want to do it. I don't cause problems. You know, I mean, so much of it is it's about them, not me, and I'm just there to do whatever they want to do. Now, I'll talk to them if I see weaknesses. Obviously, I'll have a conversation that will work on it. But it's got to be important to them, too, for them to work on it. You know? mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what I do, I mean, I do – I'm such good friends with all my guys and I'm an old dude. So, I mean, they know tell what we're talking about, you know, I mean, <laughs> life stuff, a, a tour player that's happy at his house is a tour player that's going to be playing good. you know. So, I mean, they, those guys totally, I mean, I get it that they, they look in the mirror and if they're playing good, a cool guy looks back at them. If they're playing bad. They don't like he's looking back at them. You know, they judge right. their life on that. And, you know, even guys that are really super stable, you know, they still – what they think of themselves, how good they're playing, you know. And it, it's fleeting. You can win one week and miss the cut. I've had a ton of guys win and miss the cut the next week. I mean, it's it's brief. So, Scott, what do, what do tour players really do, like, in their practice especially? I want to keep going down that road since that's kind of okay. my thing. But it's like, what are they doing in their practice that, like – you know, again, I'll just go to like a college player, a high school player, somebody who's striving to get on that level or just be like a really good competitive player in any sorts of whether it's a mid am or whatever. But like, what's the tour guys doing better than the web guys? What's the web guys doing better than uh, the other guys? Just in terms, because I mean, it's to me, like, I think a lot of what we do out there and performance is a direct reflection of practice. That's kind of my, my statement. You know, I think if you're bad. Well, I mean, I. I think uh, a guy like Scott Stallings is a fantastic practicer. He's very regimented in what he does. He he not only he does the whole thing. He he's eats healthy. He works out. He he practices. You know he doesn't hit that many balls because he hits it so good. Uh, but like we have a little routine we do with him like every week where it's real super structured. We do. You know, on Wednesdays, we'll do these wedge games, you know, the, you know, my Trackman Challenge games. Then his caddy would give me the distances that are the key distances that week. Then we'll work on acceleration drills for those distances. Uh, you know, we work on all the time, you know, we just jump in there and make sure that his club pass going slightly to the left just because if he's fade bias and stays on top of it, he plays really well. So we just kind of do this exact same thing. And then with the putting, he does a lot of – lately he's had this Marcus Potter guy help me with his putting, and so he worked a bunch on a setup. But with him and I, we do a bunch of the uh, track band putting stuff to uh, just make sure his launch direction is correct, correct. And he has a tempo issue, you know, where he's he gets his tempo sped up too much. So we just work on the tempo so he doesn't have a lot of hit and stroke. But every week, literally, even though it's it's not kind of written out, I know exactly what we're doing with him every single day. And he's super structured. I mean, those guys, they spend a lot of time in every area. And, you know, it's, I mean, tour guys are the same way. You take a guy, you know, a guy like Boo Weekly, he flushes it. We've never practiced his short game enough. He practices his putting a decent amount, you know, but the chipping and pitching, he never practices that much. But I get it. The guy hits 16 greens every time he plays, you know, he's just not that into it. But it's also, it's not a super strength in his game, you know, I mean, where, I really need to hammer him down and make him do that. That's probably my bad more than his, just because I don't make him do it enough. Right. How was Boo doing? He's good. He's back. Uh, he had that injury. He played Puerto Rico. He made the cut, which will really help him a lot because it'll reshuffle him up in front of a bunch of guys. Shot seven under on Saturday in the wind. I mean, the guy can go. He's just – he's rusty. You know, he's played a couple web events. I think he made a cut, one of the cuts, and then he played this tour event and made the cut. So he's – I mean, the guy's the purest ball striker ever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know you always talked about that. And I still use your word thump all the time. That's the first yeah, thing he, he says, who thumps it. Yeah, he does. It, it comes down and smashes it in the ground, man. <laughs> I love that. Cool. Um, and I don't know if you're willing to go this route, but like, I'm super curious as, you know, again, somebody who works with that many tour players, like 
hypothetically, if Tiger Woods were to call you, like, could you help him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think anybody that's any, I mean, anybody that's my level thinks they can help anybody, you know? I mean, we got egos too, but yeah, I think I could help him some. He looks like he's playing pretty well right now. No, there's no I mean, doubt. I think it's exciting for the golf world that he uh, – Oh, I love it. Yeah, he's yeah. a great guy. But, I mean, I guess like, I was trying to ask more of, um, like, what would you help him with? I think that's the you big know, It's The thing is, a lot of times it's, it's, uh, it's hard to tell. Like, I hear these guys on TV all, you know, Brandel's the best about telling exactly what he needs to do. But <laughs> – <laughs> a lot a lot of times unless you until you truly capture data the way that you like to look at it you don't really know what to tell somebody i mean you, you look at some of the obvious stuff where he kind of falls down on it a bunch and maybe runs out of room he, you know he used to have a lot of forward lean so i think whenever butch kind of had him let him shift laterally right and then he had something to do with the handle to get it back in there at 90 get the shaft straight around touch that kind of made sense to me but do I, do I think I could make him drive it better? I think I could. But also, it's not really fair for me because I, was, I rode uh, back last night from, uh, from the Honda, and I sat by Jay Haas Sr. He's Bill's dad. Right. And I watched Jay hit balls. I knew he's been struggling a little bit. And I watched, watched – uh, Bill hit balls in LA by me. You know, he was trying to just, he just had a right miss with his driver. The rest of them looked pretty good. I kind of thought he was narrowing a bunch out of the top, just kind of watching randomly. And, you know, I was pretty confident in that. Well, Jay Sr. shows me a picture of his golf swing. I wasn't even close to right. Like, had a little of it in there, but that wasn't really the problem that I saw in there. It was more of a pelvis type thing that was kind of affected how his arms went around him. So it's so easy. To like look at a TV and say, well, I do, you know, the guy announcer, right? he just needs right. to do this. Well, it's way more complicated than that, man. That thing's going so fast. And the most important thing you can do is you got to fix the one thing that'll help them the most. So, like, with where I'm sitting on the range in LA thinking, well, I'd work on that. Well, if I really got to shoot videos and really got to capture some pressure and look at it up close, that's not what I would have worked on. Yeah. That's yeah. a fair answer. Yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, and especially at that level too, I mean, you know, one bad, one bad thing. And that, I mean, that's gotta be kind of stressful on your end a little bit. I mean, you know, say the wrong thing to a dude and he messes up and starts, you know, missing cuts. That, that can't be fun. It's, it's still, I mean, I've done it so long. I don't really, it's so obvious what you got to fix on guys. If you've done yeah. it enough, man, it's not that. And a lot of times what's interesting is the, the thing that always tickles me is that people act like I think a lot of these guys that work on, you know, like the higher end, the high, high up golf instructors have done all the TPI stuff. They're working on these amateurs that are really good, way more complicated than the average tour coach is working on a tour player. I mean, so a perfect example, I'm with Tom Hoagie yesterday and He's wedged and very good. He's lined up right, man. We put an alignment rod down on the ground. I mean, <laughs> they, yeah. so it's like there are people standing back there behind the fence are like, what kind of brilliant crap's he telling them? I'm like, put a alignment rod down, man. You're lined up right and you're steeping it and hitting pulls. So, <laughs> you know, it's a, so much of it is textbook, you know, alignment. Is right. the ball in the right place? Is it? It's way more of that than – than the stuff you read on Instagram. Well, and that's that's why, because again, I remember the other thing you were talking about is when the the driver and I don't know if it was stall. I think it might have been Stallings you were talking about, but he you said he was driving bad one week and freaking out a little bit, and like ball position was a little far back, and he was yeah. thinking all this yeah. stuff and trying all this stuff, and you just basically showed him you need to put that thing up a little bit in your stance, and boom, he was good to go. So, yeah, like Stallings, like guys will get – these tour guys just don't get – like we talked about earlier, their swings don't change that much. But, you know, with him having the ball way forward, I mean, it's way up there too, you know, on his end step. With all the forward lean he has, that's the only way he can ever get kind of a negative club path. If you put – you take somebody with that much forward lean, 
and you get the ball back at all, that they're they're going to have a positive club path, you know. So, that, you know, simple fix like that. They're like, oh, okay. Or, you know, with Stallings two or three times, he'll just get lined up two left. Mm-hmm. You know, just get – because he's – he he puts the ball way up and gets slightly open to give himself as much room as possible to get the club going around the corner. And uh, you know, if he gets it gets lined up, he'll get two left and then the face will get shut at touch and it goes left, you know, start straight, go left. So So you've mentioned a negative club path a few times. Like is that something that you like to see? Or do a you negative mean, club path? Yeah. And for I mean that's just to kind of put in lamest term, that's swinging a little bit to left, right? Yeah, that's a fade bias club path. Yep. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, golf, when I was a kid, everybody hit a push draw, you know. Played a lot of balls. The ball didn't go that far. We're hitting little wooden-headed clubs. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody, literally, everybody hit a push draw. To be honest with you now, everybody kind of hits a – there's a few guys that hit a push draw, but the average guy on tour hits a fade now. It's because it's a shut face shot. You're delivering a shut face, so you're not timing up the close of it. You know, it's just and with a you know these guys are powerful, and the ball goes forever. And you know, I mean, if you look at down the list, or Rom and Dustin, and I mean, just go down the list of the big guys that just hit hammer fades. You know, right? It's just if I had a big six foot, you know two kid that was my son and he was strong and hit it a mile i mean it obviously i'd bow his wrist up at the top and teach him to hit a fade it's just so repeatable hmm. it's yeah. not the greatest thing to teach a guy if they want it i've never really have guys that are super fade bias that are great short game guys because those two patterns don't match up you know there's a few guys that Anybody that swings it up there and then change direction, they're pulling the handle down to the right leg, right-handed golfer, and they're shutting the face up there. That's not a great chipping pattern. Most of the best chippers or wet distance wedge guys are into out guys. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's a better – and that's where I'm saying there's give and take, you know, and as the, as the instructors out there in the world that are listening to this, I mean, the thing I can tell you, a really valuable – thing to do is identify what kind of pivot a guy has Has he got a has he got a fade bias pivot or has he got a draw bias pivot and is he trying to play the right shot with the pivot that he has because it's way easier to make them hit the shot their pivots given than to change their pivot to make them hit the shot they want right because it's kind of hard to change how the body moves right right you know the guys that keep in there forever so somebody gets on a 3d and when they wind up they're their spine moves more target side, you know, so if they're start at 90 or 91 degrees and then at the top of the swing, their spines lean three or four degrees towards the target. Generally, those guys are fade bias guys. If you get a guy on a gears or somewhere and they wind up, they're at 90 and they jump right to 92, 93, normally those guys are draw bias club path guys. Hmm. So I always look at that and try to match those up right out of the gate, you know. Right. Um, so I guess lastly, you know, you mentioned a few times about like fitness and, and stuff like that. I mean, do you really have to be able to move a certain way to be able to swing the club? Well, because I, I can't pass most of those TPI tests and I can thump the ball. I mean, I, I don't mean that braggingly, but I mean, uh, I mean, but I get my ass trouble for this. Like <laughs> <laughs> the whole fitness thing, man, it's it's I do I think it's important the guy's in decent cardio shape and that he takes care of himself. Yes. Do I think a physio guy can make a guy hit a like I I'm with, I've been with every one of them out there, and you'll show them the pattern you're working out, and they're like, oh, his left calf's too weak and his left ankle, and I'll fix that and it'll fix it. And I'm like, all right. Six months later, I'm like, he's still jumping up right here, man. What do you think? Did we straighten up his calf yet? You know, so. I mean, that boo weekly drinks natural lights and like rides around on a tractor and shoots stuff and he <laughs> cures it. You know? I mean it's just I but I don't wanna I the the one thing like earlier question, like those top ten or fifteen players in the world, there is merit to it because those guys are all doing everything. They're working out, they're watching their diet, they're getting the right amount of sleep, they're doing it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but are there different forms? Like uh, I started helping Jason Bone again. He was the first guy I ever taught. He's 
had some back problems over the years. He super got into Pilates. He's like, that's the greatest thing he ever did. He's like, if I had to do my tour career again, I would literally just do Pilates about three or four days a week. And give me the flexibility. Because, I mean, you'll see guys put on a lot of mass, and it doesn't give them speed. We were uh, – whenever the FedEx Cup was at uh, Cricket Stick, one of the FedEx at Cricket Stick well, was two or three, four years ago, Jason Day had put on a lot of – Jason Day had put on a lot of mass, and I was talking to him, and, and actually Charles was talking to him, one of my guys, and – He's like, man, I put all this mass on, and when I won the PGA at uh, Whistling Straits, my ball speed was 180, and now it's 170. So it's like some of that resistance training really didn't generate any speed, you know. Mm. So, I mean, I still think the jury's out on all that. Do I like my guy? All Most of my guys all do have a physio guy that travels with us that does – the important stuff they do the that theragun thing on them they do deep tissues stretching them that's the part that i like the best where they'll go loosen the guy up before he goes out at six o'clock in the morning i mean you play golf at 6 a.m it feels bad i don't care who you are well these guys are teeing off all the time i think one of my first guys this morning was at six something it's tough but if you can get them to work you out stretch you warm you up a little bit before you go to the tee i think that those kind of things super help the longevity of a player. Uh, you know, one of the super things I'm interested in is just identifying what are things that put like a lot of pressure on a guy's back because these modern swings are so fast. There's so much speed. It's not good on your body. Right. It's repetition, repetition. So like anytime I get any of the guys in that help, you know, the, the torque guys or the, 3D guys, I'm always asking, like, what patterns cause injuries and try to understand those, you know? Well, you know, that's interesting, too, because, um, I mean, the guys in the old days got hurt a lot, too, right? Like your Nicholson. Yeah, they did. Yeah. You know, with that big back bend. But it's like anybody that's going that hard swinging a club, I mean, it's kind of a weird position to be standing in, <laughs> like, you know, bent over and rotating and all that stuff. Yeah. No so, doubt. There's 100%. And, and – you know, just anything you can do. Like, I've always kind of just done redneck version. The one thing I liked about the speed sticks was the swinging them left-handed and learning the muscle and skill set and feel like you're balancing a guy out the opposite direction. Like, I don't think you could make a guy hit enough if they had one club that was left-handed, hit enough shots the other direction to try to balance the body out and pull it that way a little bit, you know. I mean, that kind of makes sense to me. Well, and, and it's interesting, too, to kind of give those guys a little credit that, you know, I, I was somebody who got really bored when I practiced when I was younger. So I started hitting lefty. Like, I batted lefty in baseball. I, just, I was the, kind of that experimenter. And so I started playing lefty, and I got to the point where I was actually pretty good and would, like, start going hustle people. <laughs> like, hey, yeah. you want to put some money on us, I'll play left-handed, and then I would, you know, thump them. <laughs> uh, you know, give me some strokes or whatever. But, in, like, today I can still hit the ball over 300 yards, and I hardly ever swing a club. Like, yeah. I'm, you know, part of it's equipment. I mean, I'm 60 yards longer now than I was in college, and I, yeah. I'm not stronger by any means. But I think there is a lot of merit to the fact that I can still hit. You know, I took one of my lefty kids' clubs just yesterday. I hit a two iron like 200 yards yeah. left with one, my first swing of the day. So it's like, I mean, I guess there is merit to that, like you said, kind of both sides of it. I think it'd be an interesting experiment if somebody wanted to mess around with it and they took a group of, you know, pretty good young – 12, 13, 14 year olds, and they just ingrained part of that left handed training in there and see what kind of results they got and how much their club head speed went up and, you know, kind of check, check them through the course of their time and injury, especially the ones that ended up being, you know, serious players. So, right. Well, Scott, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. I mean, can you, uh, I mean, you got like so many good, funny stories. Is there something you can just kind of share from the tour that, um, uh, was like really amusing or just I mean any good story you have just from I guess recently or any time on the tour oh hey let me think about that I've got a big gazillion of them uh, take your time just said I mean it's always your stories are always like super entertaining to me so I figure we'd get one or two on the uh, <laughs> let me think about some yeah, of my time. my you know I normally I I normally tell you know most of my stories are Forever, you know, neither one of them are – well, Boo's back playing now, and Bowditch is, is – he's 
in the middle of rehab where he had uh he had two vertebrae that were fractured in his back and he just had like a major back surgery Ouch. so he's in rehab but when those two guys and i'm super close with both of those guys and i've taught both of them forever and whenever those those two characters were together man it was that was some crazy stuff the stuff they would do <laughs> but you know probably one of my favorite stories about about boo boo is such a phenomenal ball striker and this has been years ago when he literally just didn't miss if he didn't play well he just didn't putt well you know it wasn't ever his hitting and we were i think we we're at court of all uh when they used to play that event out there and it was it was uh Baldo and boo were playing kevin kisner and scott brown in a match and boo hadn't been he hadn't hit bad, but he just hadn't been, been hitting it great. And I think he and Bowdo might have been down a couple. They were playing along over there on about – Booze just keeps – he's just building steam, man. He's just getting hotter and hotter as this round's going on. And So they're playing this par five, 14, 15, 16, something like that. It was pretty late in the round. And he hits one out of the fairway, and he lands on the green. It's like 30 feet left of the hole. And, I mean, he just absolutely goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> so he takes his – his wedge and he the bag's laying on the ground and he takes his wedge and he just tomahawks it and hits the bottom of the bag. Well the wedge sticks in the bag. So, you know, Kiz is funny as hell too, you know, if you're ever around Kiz there, that guy's a riot. So we're all just sitting there watching him and the boo gets in a rage and the wedge won't come out of the bottom because it's in that hard plastic stuff. So the next thing, and this tells you how strong Boo is, Boo's got the bag up spinning around over his head on the end of this wedge. And, like, the clubs, it's like a yard sale. There's just, like, crap absolutely everywhere. Like, it's just in a big 360 circle. It's just spun out like a helicopter. And then, he, you know, we're all sitting there just like, this is the greatest thing we've ever seen, man. If anybody had a video, it was on the way ball. So he goes, and so when he's finally done with his fit, he just reaches over and, like, unzips the thing and, like, gets his – I guess he gets his tour ID and his billfold out – puts in his pocket and just walks off to the clubhouse. <laughs> so everybody's just sitting there gut laughing at him. And this, I think this was on a Tuesday. And uh, he's up there. By the time we get to the clubhouse, he's sitting in, the, in this one little room. And he's sitting in there. There's three or four empty beer cans. I mean, it wasn't 30 minutes later. And he's just, I'm over this golf pro, man. I'm over this stuff. <laughs> and he literally – Never came back to the golf course until his tea time. I think he finished like 20th or something, stupid. But I mean, yeah, just the right balance just egging him on. Man. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I got tons of boo stories. I mean, they're those two guys or something. I can't tell many of them, honestly. So, but yeah, there you go. There's, there's just some entertainment. Awesome. Well, Scott, uh, I don't want to take much more of your time on your day off, but I really appreciate you coming on, sharing. Always great wisdom, and I know you're busy, so like it means a lot. It means the world to me that you're on here with me, and uh, I'm hoping we can catch up soon. Yeah, just uh, tell you, tell your people out there. I try to post decent stuff on my Instagram. It's Scott Hamilton Golf, mm -hmm. and I try to put instructional stuff on there and explain what I'm doing and kind of a dumbed down version. So uh, you can give me feedback on that if if y'all have any questions or like what I'm doing or want me to put something up. I'm glad to do it. Well, Scott, that's, I mean, that's one thing I appreciate is like your willingness to help. I mean, with your success level and everything, I've never seen you out there like, you know, look how good my players are doing under me and stuff. Like, I just never seen you fall into that trap, which is uh, pretty amazing because I think that's the, that's the bulk of the world is everybody, like, look how good my player is doing and all that stuff. So, like, I, well, I – that's the, the problem with that is I've got so many that somebody's not doing good. <laughs> I got a humbler every week, bud. Trust me. I when I kick up my like my page, I'm not looking at the guy at the top. I'm looking at the one at the bottom down there. Right. Going, oh my God, what are we gonna do about that? You know. So, <laughs> well, I mean, Scott. I tell people all the time the, the the main thing about being a tour instructor is I'm a genius on Wednesday and I can be a dumbass on Thursday. So. <laughs> there you go. Life on the tour, right? All right, man. So I appreciate you, Scott. Thanks. And if there's anything else you want me to shout out to the people, I'll, I'll put it in the comments on the video and stuff like that, too. But uh, again, I can't thank you enough.